So it is my great pleasure to introduce a very dear friend of mine and the CEO of Shielded Technologies, Iram Barak. Iran and I have been working together for a few years now, and he's had the heavy, insanely difficult lift of having to build Midnight, well, probably the most complex cryptocurrency ever conceived. So give him hell. You. And you get a magazine. Ah, good catch. I'd throw the Nintendo, but... <laughs> wow, good morning. Tough act to follow. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Iran. I lead Shielded Technologies. Good morning. We are the labs, or the engineering company, building the Midnight Network. And today, I want to share a few words about how we could bring Web 2 and Web 3 together. Now, I believe everybody here in the audience is a fan of Web 3, and we're all excited about blockchain and technologies, but if we go outside to the casino or the street, very few people know about this, very few people have heard about even Bitcoin. So the question is, why is that happening? How can we get everybody else kind of going on this? William Gibson said, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. We, the people in this room, you guys are the pioneers leading the effort. And it's exciting about what we're doing, but do people really care? I want to do a quick survey. How many people here have a pass for rare evil? Raise your hand. Few people didn't raise their hand. I guess security is a little bit lax on day two. Let me try something else. Now, now that we have the control group, how many? You know what? Pick an app on your phone. You don't need to pick it out. Just think of an app: financial app, healthcare, game. Raise your hand if you know which technology this app is built on. If it's database or blockchain. Heck, raise your hand. Okay, I got one, two. Raise your hand if you know which data center it's running, if it's Amazon, Google, Azure, or even raise your hand if you know where it's running, in the US, Venezuela. The reality is, as users, we don't care. We don't care, it doesn't matter. It's the operators, the builders, that we need to convince to get us to where we want to be with Web3. We want to move from a world where we need to trust intermediaries to a world where we trust math, where we can provide proofs. Now, there are three challenges that we believe are preventing that from happening. They're really around predictability, privacy, and composability. Let me unpack those for you. If I wanted to build a new app, let's say a DeFi app, and I needed to know how much it's going to cost me to run, right? I'm an entrepreneur. I'm going to put on a business case, try to get investors. The investor is going to say, how much money do you need to build this? I need to forecast how much money this app is going to need over the next five years. Let's say I'm building this on Ethereum. Can anybody here give me the price of Ethereum across the next five years? I challenge you to do that. That's going to be very hard. And so building a business case on Web3 is a challenge. If you look about privacy, we had Zonix here yesterday talking about real world assets, fantastic ideas. How many of us really comfortable in having all of our assets all shared and disclosed for everybody to see, every transaction to happen there? Not very many people. In fact, if I ask any of you to go, let's say, downstairs and tap your phone, let's say you had a Bitcoin wallet and you wanted to go and gamble, as soon as you tap that, the casino has your wallet address and they can go back and see all your transactions since the beginning of time. They will see all your transactions forever. Somebody once said Bitcoin is like Twitter for your bank account. There are no secrets. And lastly, on composability, I think we have a challenge in Web3 with islands. Everywhere is a closed ecosystem. We use the same token both for payment, for governance, for security, everything. And we never allow others to come on in. How many people here travel from outside the US? Anyone? Wow, a lot. 
I beg to assume that when you went and bought coffee this morning and paid with your credit card, you didn't think much of it, right? You just tapped your card and it worked. It charged something in your bank account back home in euro, yen, whatever it was. It all magically happened. And yet, we can't go on an app on Solana and pay with Bitcoin for that app or an Ethereum and pay with USDC or Cardano. Why is that? Why do we need to get locked into an ecosystem and have to live in that ecosystem? Web3 should be more homogeneous, allowing us to cross all borders. So as we thought of these challenges, we realized that every generation of blockchain was built on the generation before it. Satoshi gave us Bitcoin, store of value, decentralized, that's great. Then Ethereum came in, gave us programmability on top of it, enhanced it. Then we went to Cardano with governance and scalability. And we keep on enhancing and enhancing these. And there's a little bit more room for improvement, but some things you just can't fit in unless you put them in the ground up. You can't just slap privacy or new economics just after the fact. You gotta think outside the box, or in our case, maybe outside the jar. So as we thought of what it's gonna to take to go into the next generation, the fourth generation of blockchain, we believe there are two components that are gonna be needed. One is the introduction of privacy from the ground up, and the second is a new th way to think about tokenomics. Let me unpack this for you. Privacy, I know people think privacy is, oh, I'm just going to encrypt the data and put it on chain. That's not privacy, guys. If you then later give your viewing keys to the other person or the other party, they have full visibility to everything, everything you put there. And then they can take that data and give it away and do whatever they want. What we really want is rational privacy, where we have selective disclosure. I'll give you an example. Let's say I want to go to the casino here or a bar and I need to show a proof that I'm over 21. The bouncer may ask for my driver's license, but honestly, they are just trying to see that I'm over 21. They don't need to see my home address or my full birth date or anything else. If I want to do a financial transaction, I just want to prove that I'm a KYC user. I don't need to send in a photo of my passport and my utility bill. It's just crazy the amount of information we're giving away just to get things going. We need ability to have control over our data and privacy in a rational sense in a way to selectively disclose who we share with and what we share. And it's not just the data itself, it's also the metadata. Everything that is happening on a blockchain can be traced and transact. I know many people who follow Nancy Pelosi's uh, you know, trading portfolio. We have to keep all these things at a grade where we choose who gets to see them. The other part that we need to do is around tokenomics. The challenge, as I said, is that we are using a single asset token for everything, both the security, the governance, it's the gas fee, it's the reward fee. We're loading up so many things on a single asset that just can't figure out how to make it all work with all these stakeholders apart. We need to rethink this paradigm. This has worked for the first three generations, but no more. We've gone to the end of it. It's time we introduce a dual component tokenomics where we have separation of security and governance from the gas fee that we pay. I'll give you an example of what we did at midnight, and then I'll show you how the combination of these two components, a new tokenomics and privacy working together, allow us to overcome the challenges. So at midnight, what we did for making two tokens is we devised one asset, it's called Knight, it's a regular token everybody can use. Holding Knight generates a second resource called Dust. Imagine like night being a lifetime subscription to an energy company that just keeps on generating energy called dust for you. And you can store that energy in a battery or a dust wallet, and that is used to power your house. 
now dust like any energy kind of decays and you know we just need to keep on replenishing that how does that model help us solve the conundrums that we saw before so let's take the example of operational predictability if i have again i'm going to go back to the defi app that we were trying to kind of launch and i know i need let's say a million transactions per month I can figure out how much a transaction would cost in dust, and uh, therefore I can figure out how much night I need to hold that will generate that enough dust to run the million transactions. Why is that better? Because the fluctuation in the price of night does not impact my operating cost. We huddle night. We don't need to spend night like we spend ETH or SOL. We just keep it holding. It keeps generating dust forever, and we get to run the operation for as long as we need. So now, if I need to build a business plan, I can easily do that and quantify exactly what is the cost that is needed to run over the next five, ten, twenty years. Not only that, if we think about privacy. As I said, we want to protect the data. We'll probably use either encryption or zero knowledge for attestation, but we're also going to shield the metadata. And here's again where these two components kind of come together. You see, privacy before or shielding the gas token in order to protect metadata was something that most blockchains didn't think about. But when you introduce that, you get in trouble around compliance. Compliance has never been something that blockchains really cared about. It's usually something the DApps should care about, right? Because you need to know if you're building a DApp that is, I don't know, selecting a birthday date, or are you doing a financial DApp? Are you using a accredited investor as a user, or are you just general public? Are you operating in the U.S. or in Hong Kong? Different rules apply. So. DApps were the guys that needed to worry about compliance. We never thought blockchain needed to do that. We thought, oh, okay, we'll just support them. But once you think about shielding the gas token, you cross the line because I can buy a hundred dollar worth of a shielded token, let's say like Monero, and give it to Mauricio over there, and we've just done. A transaction that is completely shielded and could be conceived as money laundering, and suddenly the regulator got very interested in what we're doing. So the way you solve this is by actually having privacy work with a dual component model, because you can shield dust, you can shield the resource, the gas that pays, and not shield the night token. And the reason it works is because we can put restrictions. On the gas, not to be transferred between users. You're thinking, wait a second, how's that going to work? Think about again the analogy of an energy, right? I can charge a battery, but I cannot move the energy from one battery to another. I can charge many batteries, but once it's charged, that energy is used just for that house or that dap. And when we showed this to Mika regulators, they were very happy because finally we are not kind of at odds. We can deliver privacy with compliance. The last challenge was around composability, and here again we're we're coming back to: Can we pay cross border? Can we just bring the economies together? Now remember, we have an energy kind of flowing, right? We have. Night charging dust. What happens if we don't need all that capacity? We may be an investor. We may just have more than we need. Is that energy going to waste? Hopefully not. We can create a secondary market where people that actually need capacity, need to access the network, can do so and be helped by people who have excess capacity or excess dust. Now, how would those people that need to access the network pay? For such service, well, obviously they don't have night; otherwise, they would have dust and could operate. They could pay us with ETH or Sol or ADA, and suddenly you realize that you can operate transactions on midnight and pay with any currency that you want, 
any of them making Midnight composable with any other blockchain. You can run, let's say, a dApp on Ethereum, and that needs some KYC, and they can pay for a Midnight KYC with ETH and make it all composable. Now, here is the final twist. If you're a Web2 user, you're used to just having a web API and paying in dollars. I just told you we can pay with ETH, Sol, but you can pay with fiat, dollars or euros. And so finally, we can make Web3 feel like Web2. We can have an API with predictable costs that you can pay for with dollars or euro or pounds, and there's a whole Web3 experience behind it that you just don't care about, but it's a magic that is happening behind the scene. We just made Web3 feel like Web2. We believe that if we bring these three things, we're gonna be able to cross the chasm. We are gonna move from a place where cost predictability is an issue, privacy is an issue, Composability is an issue to a place where we have the ability to make a business case. We have the ability to selectively disclose what we actually want to disclose and not share what we don't. We have the ability to be composable across blockchains and across ecosystems. Working all that together, that's how you create the next generation of blockchain, the fourth generation. And I hope Midnight and other chains will follow through on that story. And we're excited to see Midnight roll out later this year with that promise. Now, before I leave you, I have two more things to share. We believe in open source. We believe in sharing what I just told you and the story of Midnight and all these novel ideas with the rest of the world and we're going to make them available for everybody to access. On Thursday, we announced that we became shielded, became a premier member of the Linux Foundation, Decentralized Trust. They are a great partner to help bring open source capability to the market and make it available for everyone to use. We're working to contribute Compact, which is our smart contract language that is TypeScript-based, into the forefront and making that available for everybody to have programmable privacy for all chains and across chains. Further to that, I think uh, the buzz this week has been on another story, which is the Midnight Glacier Drop. So like any other chain that wants to launch, we want to bring the tokens in the hands of as many people as possible. There are 55 days left, folks. 800 million tokens have already been distributed, and I hope to see every person here and every person listening be a part of the story. If you're holding tokens in any of those eight chains mentioned up here, Cardano, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, Solana, BNB, Avalanche, and BAT, you have the opportunity to come and receive some night tokens. Think about it this way. If you have night tokens, you have access to midnight transaction capacity for life, for free. Do not miss this once in a lifetime opportunity to get access to this. I wanna thank Fami here, Syed, who is from the Midnight Foundation for their partnership. I want to thank Charles Hoskinson from IOG and all the team there for their support. It's been great having you all here. I hope to connect with you. We've got a booth if you want to learn more about Midnight and our story. And I wish you all a fantastic rest of the conference. Thank you very much.